more than 25 years ago, I remember having a season of my life where everything I read in scripture just jumped off the page and, and exploded itself like a Chilton's manual. I would read a single verse and things would be revealed to me that I had not heard anyone teach yet. And I would dig deeper and I would find other verses. And I'm a big fan of the Thompson chain cross-reference. So when you read a verse, it will refer you to other passages that may be at different times, their Old Testament or New Testament, or you may be reading in the Gospels and it sends you to the epistles or it sends you to the book of Revelation. And as you jump from one place to the other, you see the same idea in a deeper context. At that same season, as I would read and study and the word would come alive on the page to me in a whole new way, there would be brand new revelations that no one had ever taught. And I would write these down in my journal and, and I would pray and I would hear the Holy Spirit say things that, that were directly to me, that were directed to me, things that I was supposed to do and change and challenge in my own life. And I remember in that season, there was one particular series of five or six nights that the Holy Spirit just poured into me. And it's probably uh, 15 or 20 pages in my journal. But on one particular page, I remember the Spirit speaking to me kind of in a spirit of prophecy. And I was probably 22, 23 years old. And he lined out all of the things that I was made for. A very powerful description of what I was called to do. And then he said, stop and understand that there's a glass ceiling above you. Now we're not talking about the glass ceiling that is the imperceptible, undescribable, undefinable reason that women or minorities make less money than white men. We're not talking about the glass ceiling of, of educational limits. We're not talking about the glass ceiling, uh, glass ceiling of societal norms or cultural differences or generational curses. We're talking about a limitation placed by God. And he was very, very clear that I could see through this glass ceiling all of the things that he had called me to, all of those gifts, all of those talents, all of those abilities, all of those opportunities. They were, they were like right there. I could just, I could see them. I could touch them. Other people had already begun to identify them. I won my first award for speaking while I was still in high school and no one predicted it. I hadn't trained for it. I hadn't planned for it. No one knew it was going to happen, but I got thrown into a classroom because I was acting like an idiot in the hallway. And when they threw me in that classroom, I walked out of that series of competitions with the first place overall for impromptu speaking. That's a natural gift coming to light. I had not been trained. I had not taken speech classes before. I had no idea what I was doing. In fact, with the first class, I didn't know what the name impromptu speech meant, but it was my gift. And I sat there in that moment that the Holy Spirit was revealing these things to me. And that gentle tap on the shoulder, the Holy Spirit said, do you see that glass ceiling? If you break it, if you pursue those things with reckless abandoned ambition, when that glass ceiling breaks, it all disappears. Poof, gone like a vapor. I said, well, what's the glass ceiling? How do I get past the glass ceiling? If, if it's there and it's mine to be had and, and it's what I'm called to, how do I go beyond that? And he said, there's one key that opens that. Only one. And you'll have to discover the key. And you'll have to wait for the key to be revealed to you. And you'll have to learn to use the key. Because if you don't, then your ambition to do that will destroy your hopes of doing that. And I thought, well, that's like a Riddler's Riddler, a Puzzler's Puzzle. I don't know what a, what a key to a glass ceiling might look like. How do, you, how do you find something to open the invisible, the, the translucent that you can see right through it? Why can't I just go right through it? And over the 25 years since then, I bumped my head right up against that ceiling. It was ironic last night as I taught the class at Equip or facilitated really is a, a better um, description because last night what we did was invited those who have made it this far. Now you've heard me talk about this class before. This is where we empower people 
to teach at a higher level. And we always have dozens of applicants and a few dozen will make it the, through the cut and, and a couple dozen might make it in the class. And last night we had seven left who did their very first trial by fire, 10 minute presentation with peer review. And it was ironic to me how many of them talked about the pursuit of their ambition and their goals. They talked about having tried to walk out what they know their gifts and their talents were supposed to be. They've tried the full-time ministry thing and it didn't work out for them in that season. And they're rebooting, they're restarting, and they're asking, what have I done wrong? What could I do better? That was the topic of their own presentations. It was a general theme that kind of fit through everybody. One talked about how engaging in this process made the engagement between mother and son a place where you have to reboot and get back to the foundations and back to the basics. So I want to tell you something that you may already know, but you haven't really taken to heart, and that is leaders struggle. Leaders struggle. Leaders struggle with their identity. They struggle with their place in life. They struggle with their circle of influence. They struggle with the people they allow to influence them, and they struggle with the people they influence. Sometimes leaders don't take any responsibility for the influence that they've had and the damage they might have done. Sometimes they take so much responsibility that you can't separate the mentor from the protege. The protege has no identity of their own because the leader doesn't know how to move the spotlight to them and let them grow up to be themselves. They're trying to create mini-me's rather than creating fully developed individual leaders. Leaders struggle. But among all the things that leaders struggle with, I want to share with you a passage. And, and if you go back to the video, you'll see a, a more in-depth teaching on this uh, September the 2nd of this year, September the 2nd, 9-2 of 2016. There's another video on this same passage with a little different angle. But the passage is the one on the screen. And it's Philippians chapter 2 starts at about verse 5, and it says, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of the status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave and became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was incredibly humbling in the process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all, the glorious honor of God the Father. Now you also know that I've been recently studying, and I'm nearly done, I think I've got about 30 pages left, Divine Detours by Pastor Cyan Alfred. Now Cyan is a man who's been in the ministry many, many years. He's led churches and led worship and spoken, I believe he's in Germany this week, uh, teaching on worship again. And the power of God's work in his life is evident the number of lives that he's impacted, the songs that he's written, the things that he's done. And yet, in, by his own admission, in his own book, he talks about the fact that we, as leaders, we struggle. I, I wrote in the margins next to this little passage, I'm, you can see how much I scribble as I study. Uh, I wrote, don't let this be you. This is on page 217 of Divine Detours. If you don't have this book, it's on Amazon. It's also on cyanalfred.com. Get a copy of this book. I don't care where you are in leadership. If you're the person who's saying, I've been to every seminar, I've been to every training class, I've got every certification I could possibly muster, and I still feel like I'm not moving where God called me to move, you need this book. All right, so here's, here's the season that I want you to understand. Page 217, he says, why is insecurity, excuse me, why is security so important? Because not knowing who you really are, who God made you to be, is the source of personal insecurity. That's pride. 
Insecure people make poor leaders because they can't admit their need for help, accept responsibility for mistakes, show weakness, or allow others to shine brighter than themselves. Insecure people must always be the smartest, the best, the most capable people in the room, and so they attempt to make others appear smaller. They'll even go so far as to make others feel insecure in order to maintain their own superiority. Insecurity is the leading indicator of pride. It's the cardinal sign and symptom that pride is present in a person's heart. Don't let this be you. He goes on to say, I would estimate that I have heard at most two messages dedicated entirely to the subject of humility. Sadly, I don't even remember them as something inspiring. Churches teach about love, blessing, worship, joy, peace, and the list goes on, but no one wants to talk about the root of it all, humility. Humility is not a fruit of the Spirit. Humility is the root of the Spirit. It is the soil in which the fruit of the Spirit grows. You can't love without humility. You can't have peace without humility. You can't have self-control without humility. Humility is the virtue of all virtues. Andrew Murray says it this way. Humility is the only soil in which the virtues of grace may grow. The lack of humility is the sufficient explanation of every defect and failure. Humility is not so much a grace or a virtue along with others. It is the root of all because it alone takes the right attitude before God and allows him as God to do all. Humility is a posture of the heart. Humility is how you know who you are. When you know yourself, you know you will know God and your position before him. I'm telling you, if you don't have this book, go get a copy of it. Wherever you are in life, as a leader, as an influencer, whether you're speaking and teaching or you're parenting or you just go to work every day and you come home every day and you don't see yourself as a leader or an influencer at all. Here's the reality. Every time a word comes out of your mouth, you're challenging, you're encouraging, you're building up or you're tearing down, you're speaking life or you're speaking death. And if you do those things as humans on this earth tend to do and you do them without humility, because you have your own sense of being, your own sense of pride, your own sense of confidence, your own sense of strength, you will fail not only at leading those God's given you to influence, but you will fail at those things God has set above you, set before you, those things that are so great you could never even ask or imagine. And they will remain just on the other side of that glass ceiling. It took me over 20 years to discover that the glass ceiling was humility. To discover that understanding that all of the gifts and the talents that he's poured into me to use are not my gifts to have. They're his gifts to give back. I wanna close with this illustration. A friend, Mike Arnold, we've done business and ministry together for over 20 years. Mike shared this illustration with me one time and I believe it was a revelation for him. It was for me when he said it and I think it will be for you today. He said, when you go to that first birthday party and, and, and you're six or seven years old and, and you're honoring the birthday child and your parents take you to the store and they say, well, you know, little Johnny, you know what little Johnny would like. So you go pick out whatever little Johnny would like and we'll buy it for little Johnny. And you run up and down the toy aisle, toy aisle and you see everything you want. And you know how many times you've been down this aisle and your parents said, no, 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 no. And this day you pick up the best, the greatest, the brightest, the toy that you've wanted for Christmas after Christmas and never got it. And you come to mom and dad and she looks at him and she says, will Johnny enjoy that? And you say, yes, of course, because I would love to have it. And you buy that toy and mom pays for that toy and you put it in the gift bag or you wrap it up in the bow. And the whole time you're shaking with anxiety and anticipation and you show up at Johnny's birthday party and you're so anxious you're half, half ready to rip the paper off yourself. What if at Johnny's party, instead of giving the gift that your parents gave you to give to Johnny, you ripped it open and tucked it under your arm and called it yours. And day after day, 
Christians do that very thing. Now, we all know the anxiety and the fun and the joy. I've watched them. Little kids who come to my kids' party, my kids at other people's party, they want to rip the, the present open and keep it for themselves. And that's not why God gave you that gift. It isn't yours. It's for everyone else. Give it away and understand that it's only the beginning of what God can and will do through you. It's only the beginning of what God has to give you to give away. But you have to give away what you have before you'll get more to give away. Humility is not the fruit of the Spirit. It's the root of the Spirit. It's the soil in which all of the other things grow. Leaders struggle. Confident leaders struggle with pride and arrogance. Powerful leaders struggle to remain humble because it's a choice. Matthew 21, 44 says you'll either fall on this rock and be broken or this rock, Christ, will fall on you and you'll be crushed to powder and scattered like dust. I am J. Lauren Norris and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.